year, 20,000 fur-bearing animals are trapped for their fur in Oregon alone. And there are some 340,000 wild animals held prisoner on fur farms throughout this state. Globally, 10 million wild animals are the victims of the trapping war, and globally, 35 million animals are confined to the slum existence of fur farms, living in small wire cages, no bigger than 40 centimeters wide, 30 centimeters high, and 60 centimeters long. That brings the total somewhere near 45 million. 45 million wild animals that the fur industry turns into products. They are fetishized, abstracted from their subjective wild existence, and turned into objects of value on the globalized fashion market. 45 million animals that are the victims of a war against the wilderness. If they are not killed by the traps laid out among their land and community, then they are driven into the confines of massive concentration camps. They become the prisoners of a war, held for their reproductive labor or killed and turned into commodities. They are killed, one by one, 45 million. The fur trade laid the foundation for modern globalization. Fur trading companies established colonies as international trading posts and built the first exploitative socio-economic relationships with the indigenous communities of this land. Today, the fur industry generates tens of billions of dollars in sales. Trading occurs in small handful of international auction houses during several fur exchanges, one of which is in Seattle, which amount to lavish parties where industry elites trade hundreds of millions of dollars and millions of dead animals in just a matter of days. All of this capitalist excess comes at the expense of wild animals, the environment, human workers, and rural communities. Trapping is beyond cruel, whether the animals caught are in painful leg hole traps, coney bear traps, snare traps, or they're poisoned. Trapping targets pets, other wildlife, and even endangered species that are all thrown out as trash animals. Some have become extinct or are currently listed as endangered because of trapping. On fur farms, life in a cage results in many behavioral abnormalities, ranging from neurotic and uncontrollable pacing to self-mutilation and cannibalism. If life in absolute confinement was not enough, these animals are destined for death through either auto-exhaust suffocation, neck breaking, poisoning, or anal electrocution. This industry is responsible for environmental degradation on a massive scale. In terms of energy, fur products resulting from wild trapping use about 300% more energy than a comparable synthetic product. Fur produced from factory farming uses about 1,500% more energy. Fur farming produces massive amounts of animal waste consolidated into small areas, seeping into the soil and washing into streams, contaminating the groundwater that rural communities rely upon for drinking water. Tanning, a process necessary for retail fur products, requires the use of poisonous chemicals and coal tar derivatives, including many carcinogens. Both workers in these facilities and surrounding communities are subject to dangerous exposure to these substances and have been shown to have unusually high rates of cancer. All of this madness, destruction, and injustice are the externalities of an industry that exists only for the benefit of the privileged elite. Fur products can cost hundreds to tens of thousands of dollars and amount to nothing more than status symbols for the rich. Fur is peddled through the global fashion industry and its markets in the capitalist linchpins of New York, Paris, London, Hong Kong, Seoul, and Toronto, among others. The fur trade perpetuates, all at the expense of animals, human communities, laborers, and the environment. The fur industry is a symptom of the global problem of imbalanced power and wealth. It is a manifestation of the ecological and capitalist crisis. It is yet another struggle of the masses, and it must be opposed. The chance to oppose it is now. We are not to stand idly by and allow this rampage to occur. We are not to forget about the plight of wildlife, the environment, workers, and communities as the holiday season approaches and mass consumer culture seizes our city. We are not to let apathy and fear encroach on our sense of urgency and passion for freedom and justice. We fight on the side of the wild. We fight on the side of the mink, the fox, the badger, the beaver, the marten, the bobcat, the muskrat, the otter, the raccoon. We fight on the side of the coyote the skunk, the weasel, the nutria, the opossum, the chinchilla, and the wolf. We fight on the side of rural communities whose local waterways are dying and whose drinking water is no longer safe. We fight on the side of communities who suffer from cancers and other, other diseases. We fight on the side of workers exposed to dangerous chemicals and substances and who work in inhumane conditions. We fight for those that have died and we will fight for those that will live. The first season is upon us and this is only the beginning. in memory.
history of all the animals that have been anally and vaginally electrocuted, gassed, and trapped because of Nordstrom's in the fur they sell. It's your fault. We have just begun to fight. of Nicholas Unger Furs. Nicholas Unger Furs is the last full fur salon in downtown Portland. It has been in business since 1906. Since the closing of Schumacher Furs and Outerwear in 2007, the 105-year-old Nicholas Unger Furs has become the oldest, longest-running fur store in town. It has remained a virtually invisible blemish in Portland's downtown area. In 2005, the store's owner, Horst Grimm, was fined $40,000 by the USFWS for the sale of fur pelts that were banned and endangered, such as Jaguar. Boo! Boo! Since 2008, the store has been consistently targeted by animal rights activists. In 2009, Horace Grimm and his son, Kai Grimm, filed restraining orders with the assistance, the assistance of the Portland Police Bureau and the courts. They abused existing Oregon law regarding the protection of elderly people and people with disabilities to stifle the First Amendment activity of four activists. The two are known for violent and threatening behavior, and there have been several noted incidents where Horace Grimm has physically assaulted activists or threatened to do so. Boo! Nicholas Unger Furs is the epitome of what is wrong with the fur industry, and Horst and Kai Grimm exemplify the aggression, violence, and greed inherent in it. For the animals, we will fight! Do what's right! Do what's right! Protesters. 
They had protest sales which were meant to bring people in to, the, to, to buy during the, the protests. They even held their own loud counter protests which were extremely interesting. Um, activists brought food, music, things like hula hoops and pogo sticks and did cheering and street theater to keep, keep people coming back. Uh, we brought a large screen TV on which to continually broadcast fur videos. We passed out flyers to educate the public. And so it became a weekly production to try to shut down the first store. So who protests the first store in July? That Portland activists do. Activists stood out in the rain, snow, the burning heat every Saturday for nearly two years. And it was hard at some points during the protest there might just be two people standing out in the cold keeping it going for the allotted time. But in the end the Schumachers were disgraced by their own behavior, they lost public support, and the first store closed. Yay. The Schumachers themselves blame the weekly protest for the closing. What activists learned is that persistence is the way to get things done. And hopefully with persistence and passion, Portland can become a fur-free city. We ask you to boycott the stores that sell fur here and let them know why you're doing so. So that's Macy's, Nordstrom, I'm sure no one goes to Angar. Um, now I'm going to run through some, a few facts about the fur industry. I think you've heard some of it already, so I'll just cut it short. Um, so numbers can vary, but up to 50 million animals are literally tortured and slaughtered for their fur worldwide. Much of the commercial fur industry is from China, and you might have seen video of animals being skinned alive for their fur. Um, and and um, what we've been told is that it's easier to remove fur from a live body than from a dead one that's gone into rigor mortis, and so that's why they do that. Um, the Humane Society of Veterinarians have found that up to 40% of baby seals in Canada are still conscious as their skin is torn from their body. Wild fur-bearing animals are caught in steel jaw leg hold traps and they're left for up to a week. Sometimes they die of cold and dehydration and they chew off their own limbs in order to get free. Their babies become orphans for the fur industry. Wild animals like mink go crazy from stress, confinement, and boredom in, in barren wire cages until they're finally annually electrocuted, they're poisoned, or they have their necks broken. Dogs and cats in China are slaughtered for their pelts, and um, Humane Society testing has shown that a lot of these pelts that come into the U.S. have been mislabeled, and they're actually dog and cat fur. So I think it's a betrayal of the trust that these domesticated animals have in us to treat them so abysmally. I think words can't really do justice to the torture these animals go through, so if you need to convince someone about fur, words don't really do it, and you might go to furisdead.com and show people video and pictures. Rise up! Resist! Shoot! furs! Hear our shout! Portland got your fur store out! It's a small family business catering to all small families. But really, it's nothing more than a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange with huge institutional investors like Bank of America. We all know Bank of America has been hated these days by the Occupy protests. Well, today we hate Bank of America too for the shares they hold in Nordstrom. There's 116 Nordstrom department stores across the country. This corporation has grown since 1901 from a family business into a massive national chain. The corporation also has a tarnished history with labor unions and its workers. Nordstrom has pressured its employees to work extra hours without pay and has even gone as far as to attempt union busting and decertification to distract it from its labor disputes. Nordstrom paid a multi-million dollar settlement to the United Food and Commercial Workers Union and employees who were not compensated for their work at Seattle Tacoma stores for such activity. And if that's not enough, 
Nordstrom has even pulled advertising for publications such as the Seattle Times and the Seattle PI for their coverage of its labor disputes, attempting to silence the press and free speech. Nordstrom has been in the spotlight of animal rights activists for decades for its sale of fur. Throughout the 1990s, the company was targeted by aggressive direct action campaigns and non-violent civil disobedience actions. Although they have done away with their fur salons and fur on their own lines, every one of their 116 stores still yields to the pressure of the global fashion industry. And every one of their 116 stores still sells many fur products. Over the last few years, animal rights activists attempted to have a conscientious dialogue with Blake Nordstrom, Nordstrom's president about removing all the remaining fur from its stores. Even though activists were not cordial and wanted nothing more than a fur-free Nordstrom, Nordstrom was clear. The bottom line was all that Nordstrom and Blake Nordstrom cared about. All that matters to corporations like Nordstrom is keeping up with the global fashion market, sales, and profits. These things have been priority over workers' rights, the environment, and animals. Diplomacy has failed in the case of Nordstrom's Incorporated. It is time we start demanding what we want instead of asking for it. Friday. I was one. I was one of 18 activists who converged on the third department at Macy's in New York City. Staff was in the dinner. They had no idea what to do. They had never encountered anything like this before. We sat there and chanted for almost four hours before the police were called. And though we wanted to be arrested, they were very apprehensive because one of the activists was wearing a Santa suit and they didn't want to be seen handcuffing Santa. So after trying to coax us into leaving, they finally arrested us, taking us out the back way. The following year, there were 100 of us and we surrounded Macy's again in New York City and told people that they were closed. <coughs> One of the employees went home. <laughs> it should not be necessary to be here 27 years later. There is a new consciousness taking place, sweeping changes in governments, humans having greater compassion for one another, and it is long overdue to have greater compassion and respect for all beings, all creatures. While people are partying and going shopping and having dinners, these poor creatures are being slaughtered, tortured, mutilated, electrocuted. It has to stop now. Yeah. Don't fight her!